so I'm just today giving a preliminary overview of the findings from a DFID funded scoping study. Um, we started this five weeks ago, people, so it's been incredibly rushed to get it to this point in time for the conference, um, as you can imagine. So, thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, so the, the main research question on the scoping study is um, what's the evidence of faith groups activity and contribution to the prevention of SGBV and to their care for survivors? Um, so that's what's been guiding us in, in, in what we've been doing. Three things, literature review, um, but also an electronic survey, 113 people invited, 51 completed, which I think is incredible for, for a survey that was open for eight days. Um, and 20 uh, key informant interviews. All of the people involved are, are global experts in SGBV in some form and faith. Um, so <clears throat> the scoping study itself, uh, the literature that we reviewed and, and selected was guided by this by the need for evidence. So, and, and that we defined as empirical research. We focus on texts that, um, that are based on empirical research, primary or secondary. So we're not, um, we're not looking at texts that is so popular in, in religious research that review religious text or on, on what should be and how things ought to be interpreted, but really looking at how faith leaders, faith communities are actually reacting to HB, SGBV in their communities. So that's really what guided us. And, and, and the second thing was we're looking at a text where, where faith and faith communities are driving the intervention, where they're not just partners of a broader strategy from a secular organization, but really driving what's, what's been going on. Um, ooh, I should be skipping. Um, so um, the, uh, there's a background docu document on the website, so I'm not going to give uh, lots of detail about the strategy, but we searched far and wide. Um, we um, we didn't limit the discipline, so it was open to anything, pretty much, which you can imagine really up the number of hits with every search. Um, and in the end, we identified 601 possible texts, and that was with an incredibly wide net. Um, uh, but then applying our final criteria, only 139 remained. And the reason is this focus on empirical evidence. So we, the moment you, you eliminate texts that are just talking about what should be based on, on what the Quran is saying or what the Bible is saying, but actually looking at, at what's going on, your numbers start to drop fairly dramatically. Um, so we included three categories of texts, which we called um, intervention text, status quo text, and model text. Now, originally, we planned on only including intervention texts, which are texts that empirically describe, and if we're lucky, evaluate a faith-based intervention. Um, but we only found 29. <laughs> So then we broadened our net a bit to look at what we call status quo text, which um, need not be on a planned systematic intervention, but just looks at how our faith is reacting and responding. So a good example would be there are plenty of studies, many of the studies were on how clergy um, view intimate parts of violence and, and how they respond to survivors. That would be an example of a status quo text. And then in the end, we decided to include also what we call model texts. And these were the only ones that need not have an empirical basis, but it would be a, 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 a document that really systematically structures how our response, how a faith group should be reacting, responding to, to SGBV. So um, what we're finding, um, 90 of the texts are academic peer-reviewed um, peer reviewed texts. Um, I should just highlight, we, we were incredibly easy in terms of what we included. So need not be academic, and need not even be gray literature. We took 
internal organizational reports, case studies, random documents, anything we could find on websites, but we also relied on the survey and our key informant interviews because these were people that are involved with multiple organizations, faith organizations. So for those people to provide us with, with possible documentation. So the, the overwhelming majority of the literature is American. Is, is based on, on research that was done here by Americans on, with an American focus and faith groups. Um, there's a big focus, uh, on basically, you can assume due to that American focus, USA focus, on domestic violence, as, as a, a domestic violence and intimate partner violence. Um, Faith-based interventions tend to focus on prevention, and that prevention is largely creating awareness and training. Um, what we're finding at the moment, um, we're finding Christianity, Judaism, Islam, and interfaith, but overwhelming majority Christian. Um, what's been interesting is from discipline of social work, five minutes, thanks. Um, how they really are highlighting the importance of spirituality for, for care and healing for survivors. And, and it's been interesting to see that evidence emerging from, uh, from non-religious disciplines, especially, like I said, social work. Um, and again and again, it's showing that survivors do want to turn to faith communities. They want to turn to faith leaders. Unfortunately, their experiences are often not very positive. Um, so that key role of faith leaders, but the messiness of faith leaders um, is, is also coming out. And then, then again, the importance of training, that's not just about creating awareness, but really focusing on influencing values and norms and behavior. Um, so the obvious gaps, where are they? Um, the fact that there is very little empirical evidence, 29 studies that actually, and these weren't rigorous evaluations, they were mostly just descriptions of what's been going on. Um, the world's not being represented. That is also due to an English bias in, in, in a four-week study. Um, but, but just America and then a bit of Africa and the rest of the world, not so much. Um, all faith groups are not being represented. We're not finding any longitudinal studies. We're not finding any RCT studies. Um, and then I was glad it was raised in the previous session briefly. We're not finding any interventions or even research being done on the SGBV experienced by other marginalized groups. So our LGBTI community, sexual violence against men, Big, big silences. Um, and then the same uh, perpetrators, we we're not finding documented evidence for faith groups in, engaging with perpetrators, really. Um, so possible reasons for, I'm very aware of the time, possible reasons for the Lisley evidence uh, is funding. Um, you know, you've got limited funding to actually be implementing things. It's just not that bigger priority for many of our faith communities and our faith-based organizations, and this is understandable as well. Um, uh, in the research with the, the key informant interviews and, the, and the, the survey, it came out that SGBV has become a focus area for most of the organizations only in the last three years. So it was saying, oh, we, our gender policy was written last year. We, we now have a gender department since six months ago. So it's, it's really a new focus area for, for, for organizations. And that, has, that means you're not documenting yet, and your academic world is, is even slower to respond to those changes. Um, Research is not being a priority, but the dissemination and the publishing of research is a challenging thing for faith communities. So it's not saying it's not out there, but it's just not that easy to find. Um, and then a big thing, I, faith community FBOs don't talk about failure. This was actually a question in both the survey and the key informant interviews, and not one specific example was shared. Everyone said, I'm not in the position to comment on this at this stage. Um, so, so these are possible reasons for the lack of research. If we're exploring, and I'm hoping you'll be exploring this at your tables, the, the possible ways of really building the evidence base, and this is things that we've been hearing for all three days now, um, 
if our funders could be prioritizing research, finding a balance between because, I mean, if you're thinking about this long term, and with SGBV, you have to be thinking long term, investing in research now to really be more strategic, and this really links with what Anna said. Um, it, short term, it's frustrating not being able to do the actual work with the money, but if you're thinking long term, it just makes so much more sense. Um, and then the next three points all actually kind of comes together to the same thing. If we can just start sharing um, between our faith communities, our FBOs, we're very, um, it's difficult to get those reports. We're not sharing things that are going right. We're not really not sharing things that are going wrong. So if they could really be a, a community of learning that we're saying, this worked for us, is it working for you? Kind of. So really, like we will speak out, we're hearing again and again, and in our own research, how much this has meant to people involved in the field, just in terms of the support. And if we can start building that out really in terms of sharing of, of our programmatic experiences. Um, partnering with academic institutions to really strengthen that research partnership. Um, I think there's a lot to explore in terms of that. And building research capacity within our own organizations. And then the last slide, I want to highlight one thing um, to problematize this a bit. is that is what do we see as evidence and what do we see as research? Um, are we imposing westernized models of m &E, which are really impossible, especially we're thinking local faith community level to implement. So should we start thinking in terms of not pushing maybe all the time for rigorous evidence research, um, but even just asking, just document what you're doing? You know, maybe finding that balance, where should we be heading? Um, yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.